The, the mob wanted a piece, I, I turned them down. This terrifying guy broke into my apartment, put a gun in my mouth, mm. uh, beat me up, and told me that if I told anyone or didn't give them a piece of my game that they knew where my family lived in, in Colorado. <laughs> Water there if you want. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear us okay? Brilliant. Um, firstly, hi, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Is this your first time in Oxford? My first time, for sure. Very nice. And how have you found it so far? Um, absolutely lovely and surprising. Yeah? I it thought, I mean, everyone is very laid back. That's good. <laughs> That's a good. That's yeah. I think there are lots of perceptions about Oxford. There's not always. a lot of perceptions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I found none of them to be true. Good. Well, that's a good start for an interview, I think. Um, we'll start, I think, at the beginning. I'm sure lots of people here are quite familiar with your story already. I'm sure a lot of them have seen the film. So I thought the first question to ask is: um, After you moved to LA, how did you get from first being involved? You know, sorry. How did you first get involved in these very exclusive poker games? You know, you were working away from being like the waitress in the room to running your own hyper-exclusive game. How did that happen? I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, there's a little bit of backstory th context that I think uh, can help un understand, help us understand. So, I was a very serious student um, and a very serious athlete, mm. and I uh, was a competitive mogul skier. And it was my whole life. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I got diagnosed with severe scoliosis. The, the surgeons um, had to basically uh, fuse my top 11 vertebrae together, put two metal rods down the side, and it rendered my thoracic spine essentially immovable. I asked the doctor when I could get back out to train. He said, you know, you're going to have a great life. There's going to be a lot of <coughs> things that you can part uh, participate in, but I think you're going to have to find a new hobby. And I don't know if it was the, the dismissive way that he said it, but I was just, I just had other ideas, you know? And so mm. um, I got back on the mountain, even though, uh, you know, medical advice didn't want me to, and my parents didn't, and I worked really hard, and I, I overcame not only this... Um, this injury and its limitations, I overcame my mind during those years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, um, you know, that, that, that sort of formed me, it made me who I was. And I made, you know, at 19 I made the US ski team and at <clears throat> 20 I was ranked third overall in North America and at 21 I made it to the Olympic qualifiers. And I had this freak accident where I kind of skied over this tiny stick and I fell really hard and, and ultimately uh, had to retire. And I didn't know who I was at all. I hadn't even thought, like, who am I without skiing? And I was at the University of Colorado. I was finishing my education. I had just taken the LSATs. If you guys have seen the movie, for some reason, Aaron Sorkin massively inflated my LSATs for. <laughs> <laughs> but I did pretty well, and I was... Um, I was uh, applying to some top-tier schools, but I, w I was just heartbroken and I was exhausted and I, I was in a place of questioning. Mm. I'd put everything and more into this thing. And, and I just wasn't sure that life was fair enough to go this conventional route and put everything you have into something that you could, you know, potentially fail it. Mm. So I was having this, you know, sort of existential crisis, and I decided I needed to go find myself, and I just wanted to be somewhere warm, so I went to L.A. <laughs> if I could go back and tell young Molly, if you want to go find yourself, Los Angeles is the absolute worst <laughs> place to do that, <laughs> bar none, I would, but I can't. And I started working... Uh, a bunch of odd jobs, and I got uh, asked one day by my boss, um, will you serve, or I t got told, you will serve drinks in my poker game tomorrow night. And so I went home and did the, you know, requisite 
research on uh, this event that you could, and I googled things like, what kind of music do poker players like to listen to and what do they eat? <laughs> and I made this incredibly embarrassing playlist with songs like The Gambler on it. <laughs> Went and got this cheese plate from the supermarket, just, you know, like Wisconsin cheese and showed up to this game. And, you know, then all these A-list celebrity walks, celebrities walked in. Uh, you've heard their names. Their names have been in the public medium. That's why I feel comfortable naming them Ben Affleck, Tobey Maguire, um, Leonardo DiCaprio. And then some of the, the, you know, people from the tech community who were changing the world. Um, a politician who will remain unnamed. <laughs> uh, billionaires, s sports stars, um, you know, head of the biggest hedge funds and banks. And, and I'm just sitting there going, wow, am I embarrassed about my playlist and my cheese plate? But as the night, as the weeks wore on, mm. it was such a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. to have audience with these people, um, to learn from these people, to um, have access to information and capital and power. And uh, I, I was just so intrigued. So when you, uh, when you took the job to do the first night, for example, did you have any idea it was going to be those kinds of people coming in? Or did you just think it was a you know, slightly more expensive poker game or something? My boss threw names around, but he was always dropping names. So mm. I, didn't, I didn't really believe him. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, the, you know, mm. it, it, they were there and, and they were there in a way that they were themselves. Yeah. Did you find that there was a lot of exchange of sort of soft power going on in those rooms? So would you say, you know, for example, were politicians being lobbied just by their kind of friend playing poker almost like over the table or were things not discussed? Oh, no, it was a it was full on discussion. Yeah. Um, as I, you know, eventually when I took over the games, I would strategically seat the table mm. um, with, you know, with p people that I knew were interested in, you know, getting a certain bill passed or um, I, I would have games with art dealers and artists you know it was just this mm. it was this way to kind of infiltrate any part of society that that I wanted. Did you ever see something uh, you know a bill be passed and think that's almost because of me or partly because of you? I didn't think it was because of me. No but, sure. Um, I, I saw you know I, I saw a lot of business movies mm. um, get the origin uh, started in that room um, hedge funds, uh, huge companies, um, ideas. Yeah. And how did it go from you being so a sort of more minor player, you know, perhaps there to look nice almost, mm -hmm. you know, um, to being the one running the game? How did that transition take place? So a couple things. Um, as the months wore on, I realized that I had this skill set that I wasn't aware of before, and that was uh, an entrepreneurial skill set. Mm. I started you know, I would look at the game and I would take all these notes and, and think about the ways that I could do it better. Um, I, you know, I could think fast on my feet. I started to really understand this concept of effective presence, which is the science of how people feel when they are in your presence. And, um, which I think is a, a very important thing to look at, mm. a very learnable skill, and I think it produces uh, extraordinary results. Um, because if you look at, we don't have to get into neuroscience too deeply, but <laughs> people use their emotions to make decisions. Mm. Um, and you also, when, when you learn how to do it, you can form real connections with people, which that is the reason why when I went off and started my own game, they all showed up. It wasn't because I had a, a ton of experience or anything. It was your connections with them. Yeah, but what happened was, you know, I, 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 I started to see that I was an entrepreneur and I didn't want to be under the thumb of my boss anymore because I didn't like the way that he was running the game. Was there anything specific that you didn't like? I think I didn't like one single thing about it. I mean, really? 
<laughs> um, I didn't like his lack of creativity in, in what he made the room look like. Mm. I didn't like how he sort of presided over the game as the, the dictator. Mm. I didn't like um, th the inconsistency with, w with, the, with which the rules existed. Mm. Um, there were certain people that I would have never let sit at that. I mean, I just, I didn't like the way he was running it at sure. all. And um, so then he made it, but I'm loyal you know, yeah. to a fault sometimes. But then he decided that he was going to give the game to this other girl that he was trying to hook up with. And so... Was that literally why? And he wanted me to spend more time in the office because he felt like I had become distracted. Mm. Um, and had, had you become a bit distracted by it? For sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm thinking of dry cleaning, um, you know, <laughs> watching, like, finding out about the... So sorry, what was your main job meant to be in the office? What were you meant to be doing? Just serving drinks. Right, okay. But then I started to really cultivate relationships. Mm. I started to um, solve problems I wasn't asked to solve. I started to keep spreadsheets on everyone. I started mm. to um, memorize everyone's favorite drink order, keep notes every night uh, of times that I saw, um, you know, people get frustrated with the process and try to improve upon it. Mm. Do you think he was a bit threatened by you probably then yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah. This is interesting, the way you talked about just then, reminding me of what you said about the very first night you did it, where you went home and you listened to music and you, and you worked out what they liked and things. It sounds like this, um, you've got a quite, a, a sort of intense uh, approach to things, right? <laughs> Does this, and in a good way, but do you think this comes from your, from your, <laughs> Not do you think this comes way. from your athletic background or have you always just been super kind of disciplined and uh, um, focused? I think this comes from Larry Bloom, <clears throat> my dad. Really? So he was a like, he, he, insisted on discipline right he called it constructive suffering <laughs> oh my i know you're suffering by doing your math homework but it's constructive it's going to get you somewhere you know and it, it was just like this constant message in our heads and then also um anytime we did anything whether it was chores or a bike ride uh you know his sort of philosophy is the way you do something is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. So like the, there was zero chill in my house. <laughs> and are you, are you glad you had that? Do you think it was good for you? <sighs> I, I vacillate, you know? Yeah. Um, has it made uh, success more achievable? Yes. Has it made it harder to live in this head yes mm. and so later in life i had to do a lot of work on that but it's continual work mm. but i think i spent a lot of my younger years thinking that if i didn't have accomplishment after accomplishment after accomplishment then then, then i didn't have worth mm. um which is you know where a lot of the intensity comes from um and then I think some of it was just who I was. Yeah. Quite interesting to go back to, so going back to kind of when you were hosting the games, um, did you use any kind of psychological strategies to get people to play? Because I know something you've talked about a little mm -hmm. bit before. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that. Yes. So when I started my own game and the, and the way that I started it is I just um, took all of my notes and, inst and like made it into a game. So mm. I moved the, the game to the... Um, suite or the penthouse at the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. I had a better playlist. I heard you guys had a little um, ball. We did. Yes. We had the Casino Royale yes. ball this week. Yes. Yep. So that was like, you know, that was part of my inspiration. Mm. I wanted everyone to feel like yeah. Casino Royale for the night and for it to feel glamorous. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I invited everyone except for my boss. Right. <laughs> which was terrifying because he was, you know, part of the Billionaire's boy, Boys Club, but he was also, like, psychotic. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> um, but, you know, I, I knew it was my shot. And mm. so, um, and then they all came, and he even ended up forgiving me and really? would play in my games. And, okay. yeah, he told me, uh, he, eventually he <clears throat> told me, I'm proud of you. Because he oh. always thought I was um, too soft and too empathetic and... <laughs> 
<laughs> Interesting. Um, and you thought I needed to toughen up, so. Um, so I would uh, have these games and, sorry, I think I lost the question. I can't remember either. I was just <laughs> in, I was enjoying I was enjoying that. Um, <laughs> what? No, there was it was a Oh, sorry. Point. I was asking you about psychological strategies. Like, That's yes, what it was. let's talk about psychological warfare. I yes. got lost thinking <laughs> about Casino Royale and everything. Yes. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, okay, so there is a hierarchy that existed in these games and it was the billionaires were at the bottom, the celebrities were in the middle, and the athletes were at the top. When, when a professional athlete used to walk in that room, <laughs> the way that, that the players used to behave was hilarious. And so early on I saw, oh, if you can get a really um, big deal athlete mm. to play in the game, it's a huge draw. So I, even if they didn't want to play, I would stake them. Right, okay. And that was, that was great marketing. And then what would happen was uh, there, this thing was so much about mythology and, mm. and a huge part of the joy of it for them was to talk about with each other, you know, like gossip and, mm. oh, you can't get into this game, but here's what happened. And so mm. they were great brand advocates. Um, the other piece of it was to not sh give any desperate energy. Yeah. You know, even if I only had two seats confirmed and someone called me and was like, I don't know if I can make it. I'd be like, okay, well, obviously I'd love to have you there, mm. but you know, I'm gonna have to know by four o'clock. Mm. So cool, just let me know, because otherwise I'll give the seat away. How were you getting these contacts? Was it starting to kind of go through other people mainly, or were you able to get some yourself? Yeah, no, I was able to get mm. some myself. So I started to do deals with casino hosts. Right, okay. In Vegas, and you know, we would, we would trade favors, and. They helped me find a lot of these players. And mm. I mean, I'll just give you one example. So there was this guy that one of the casino hosts introduced me to. And he was like a tall, good looking guy, um, was making like 60 to 100 million cash for his elect you know, electrical component company. And he lived in the valley uh, and he rented an apartment. <laughs> I mean, he was literally just like hiding in mm. plain sight and he would go to Vegas and lose 20, you know, $30 million. Wow. And so, you know, then I would, I would also um, incentive, financially incentivize socialites, mm. you know, travel the world, going to parties and, yeah. you know, it, I was just constantly always on um, the lookout. Why do you think it was, just going back to what you said before, that athletes were such the big draw? Because if you had all these billionaires, and I wouldn't have thought one crowd of people would stick out so much. You is know, it quite a male thing? Uh, from, I'm assuming the games were mainly male-dominated, is that right? The, the games were entirely male-dominated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, that is because I didn't let in any pros. Okay. Um, if I would have let in pros, uh, women would have certainly played, but I think no offense, I think women are too smart to risk $250,000 on a recreational <laughs> game of poker. I, um, no offense, because I, you know, I like, I like gambling, so. <laughs> okay, sorry, but what, yeah, why did you think the athletes were the draw? Um, or the, main, the biggest draw? I don't know, but look at games. Mm. Look at the uh, emotional identity that people take on with sports teams yeah. or, or, or athletes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's manic. Well, know? we saw the Super Bowl yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's definitely true. My boyfriend's team lost, so oh, I'm no. aware of the, yeah. <laughs> the emotions that yeah. come with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, t talking about the male-dominated nature again, how do you think you were treated as a woman in that environment? How do you think you were treated differently to had you been a man? Um, I think I would <laughs> Well, let me just give you some examples of how I was treated, and then we mm. can decide if a man would have had the same experience. So when I was s just serving drinks, a lot of the guys would hit on me, and they would offer to take me shopping, and buy me purses and whatever and I, I was like you know 
thanks, but no thanks. And they, you know, they would s call me sweetie and like, you know. Yeah. When I started my own games and I became the bank and I had to collect money from people that lost, it was a whole different game. It was like, you run, you know, like someone loses, you run the worst game in town, I'm not paying you that 25 grand, don't ever call me again. And I'm kind of like, oh, so like the trip to Barney's to get the purse is off the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but it was, it, you know, it was completely different. Um, and in the beginning, when I started the game, um, some of the like real old school gamblers would come mm. and they wouldn't look me in the eye and they wouldn't speak to me, which made it really hard because in order to get chips, you have to <laughs> come talk to me yeah. or to get more, you know, to rebuy. But, he, but they would just ask someone else at the table who would then turn around and say, can so-and-so get... Just out of disrespect, basically. Or yeah. Mm. Um, and I just... Uh, you know, it, it, it was like embarrassing mm. at first, but then I like... Then I, then I had the shift, and here's what the shift that always helps me. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about that guy, you know? Pretty old, afraid of change. Mm. Um, you know, maybe something's happened, to, maybe something happened to him in his life that made him not tr trust. You know, I, I just sort of try to get to a place of finding some empathy because it really is his problem, mm. you know? I'm here, I'm running the best game in town. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, that always helps me. I think this story and so many of the kind of, part, you know, parts of your story are, show a lot of resilience from you. And I was wondering how you've managed to keep that level of resilience, especially in these extremely stressful moments or these really, you know, disappointing moments, like the kind of the ski accident. Um, how do you think you've cultivated that through your life? In the early days, it was, I, I come from a family, um, my two brothers are very high achievers. Mm. Uh, my little brother at 16 was number one in the world. He went in, in mogul skiing. He went on to win three world championships. He competed in two Olympics, both Olympics he went in uh, number one in the world. Um, he then, went to the NFL Combine, which is the NFL tryouts, and got drafted fifth round of the Philadelphia Eagles. He was an Abercrombie model. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're thinking like, oh, this kid has to be like the worst. No, he started a charity in our hometown for uh, senior citizens who didn't have a lot of family granting wishes for them. And most recently, the kid that we thought was you know, pretty much just a very fast runner uh, started and sold a software company for a lot of money. So that's little brother. I mean, he was truly a prodigy, you know. My other brother is a uh, Harvard-trained cardiothoracic surgeon at Massachusetts General who has literally dedicated his life to saving the life of children with congenital heart defects. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have this enigmatic father who, when he's proud of you, the sun shines. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think that was where the drive came from initially. Mm. I really wanted my dad to look at me the way that he looked at, you know, my brothers. I wanted mm. to have that relationship. Yeah. I wanted to matter in, in my family. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, you know, th and then it just kind of took a life of its own. Like, then I went into the world and saw... And by the way, I fought with my dad mm. all the time because he sort of ran the family as, as a dictator. Yep. And I was like mm, a full-time, like, like I, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. Mm. Uh, I, I just fought him on everything that I felt was unfair. So I pretty much spent my childhood grounded and causing a lot of turmoil mm. in, in my family, but I just, I, did, I couldn't stand the, the inequity. Yeah. 
And thinking about one of those probably most difficult moments when you were caught uh, running your game by the FBI, yeah. what, how, how did you feel in that moment? Was there any sort of relief? Because it sounds like it must have been an incredibly kind of stressful and uh, difficult thing to do. So the, the end. so the LA game was fun. Okay. Um, I had my friends that would work with me. You know, I, we'd be in these hotel suites after the game. There'd be like a million dollars in cash in the room. Um, I, I was learning about the world from some of the people who were actively involved in making decisions that were impacting it. Mm. Um, it, it was a very incredible time in my life and um and then i lost the game mm. uh one of the players um wanted me to do things to to basically set up the game for him to win every time and i um <clears throat> you know i i refused to do that stuff and yeah um then he, it started out with him trying to humiliate me to try to, I guess, get some, me into compliance. And then ultimately he said, you know, you can work for me if you want mm. and I'll d d decide your salary, but uh, you can't run the game anymore. Really. And I, I, of course, turned him down, even though I, I loved this game and, and I, it meant so much to me. But like, if I said yes to him, then I had no sovereignty you know, mm. that, or dignity. And I just... I think that there are things that are more important. Yeah. Um, and then I went to New York, and, and New York got dark. Mm. I, I went to New York f with the sole intention to, I needed to believe that we live in a world where some movie star can't just decide on a whim to take everything from you and, and, and win. Mm. You know, I needed to believe that. Um, that I had agency still. So I decided I was, you know, just, I was like enraged. And I, I went to New York and I decided I was gonna start the biggest game in the world. But what made you decide to do that instead of getting out? Did you, if it was so stressful, or even at any point during that game, did you not think, you know what, I could just, I could walk away? Or was that not really an option for you? Well, my parents would have loved me to go back to school. It would have been a great idea to parlay everything I'd learned, the connections and everything into something, but like I said, I think I just needed to prove to myself that people like X mm. don't get to win. You know, yeah. I just needed to, I needed to live in a world like that. Mm. And so I decided that I was gonna go to New York and start the biggest poker game in the world um, just so that I could sort of prove that to mm. myself and then I would, leave right I go back to school but that didn't happen no <laughs> not in time um if there was if, if you could go back and change things is there anything you would change so you could keep running it oh. or do you think the way it turned out was you know was for the best <clears throat> I completely lost myself in New York uh my whole life I had this really firm moral center and I started to make small decisions mm -hmm. that seemed inconsequential uh, that were left or right of that center and mm. over time they compounded and I remember not even knowing who I was anymore. Mm. New York was rough. I, um, I got, you know, the, the mob wanted a piece. I, I turned them down. This terrifying guy broke into my apartment, put a gun in my mouth, mm. uh, beat me up and told me that if I told anyone or didn't give them a piece of my game that they knew where my family lived in, in Colorado. Mm. So now, you know, I'm not only putting my life in danger, I'm putting the people who definitely do not deserve it and I love the most. So mm. it was getting darker and darker. Um, and then I was getting more self-destructive. And then there was a moment where, you know, I was, my debt sheet was a little big and I did something. See, I had uh, uh, attorneys that had, we had reviewed the federal statutes and we'd come up with this playbook of running these games to, as to not violate the statutes. Mm. One of them was don't take a rake, don't take a percentage of each pot. Yep. 
and I started taking a percentage of each pot, just like that. And mm -hmm. I knew when I did it, what I was doing. And the feds had put a confidential informant in the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, you know, the, a couple weeks later, I got a message that said, the FBI is here looking for you. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I think there was a bit of relief, but mostly like fear. What changed when you decided to take the rig? Um, I was on a path of self-destruction. Hmm. Do you think there was a part of you that wanted it to yes. get shut down? Yes. Yeah. There was a time in New York when I looked around at, at my game and at the, other, at the other games that I was running, and I knew that I had violated, a, that, that most of them were, were addicts. Yeah. And that I was exploiting, you know, their vices. Mm. And it had consequence. I didn't walk away. Mm. And so from that sort of moment on, I think I had to make a choice. Who are, who are you going to, who are you going to be? Did you have anyone you could go to at that time? Um, I, I was thinking just the way you were telling it, it just sounds incredibly lonely. Like, like it was incredibly lonely. Yeah. Yeah, really lonely. Um, really dark, mm -hmm. lonely. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think I wanted it to end, but I didn't know how to walk away. Yeah, the last thing I'll ask you before we go to the audience for some questions is just, so how did you come out of that? So once, you know, you were called by the FBI, but then obviously you've now got the book and you've got the film. How, how has that happened? So, um, the, the feds took all my money. Uh, I logged into my account and said negative $9 million. Then I went home and for two years heard nothing, tried to put my life back together. Uh, when I finally um, got a job, <laughs> which was not easy, I moved back to LA. Seven days later, I got arrested in the middle of the night by 17 FBI agents, machine guns, the whole thing. That seems a bit unnecessary. Yeah, it was a <laughs> pretty ex excessive show of force for a beagle and a girl. <laughs> um, and then I was in this, you know, I got to put me handcuffs, put this piece of paper in front of me that said the United States of America versus Molly Bloom. Mm. I um, started working with a, an attorney, Jim Walden. And um, a couple days later, uh, the prosecutors wanted a meeting. And this, uh, this was the Southern uh, District of New York, and this prosecutor with slicked back hair was super excited to meet me. And he said, we don't care about the Italians or the Russians. Like, we want to know about the celebrities and the politicians and, <laughs> and uh, the billionaires, because we know that they're behaving badly. <coughs> And you've had private audience with them uh, for seven, you know, seven years. Mm. And he said, if, if you're willing to come work with us, which is the right thing to do, um, and become a confidential informant, we'll give you all your money back. And we'll give you a deferred prosecution, which will keep you out of prison. And I had 24 hours to make this choice. And I went home, and I thought about it. And uh, here's where I got to with it. This whole thing was my fault. <laughs> I had near perfect information on the laws, great family, um, all the opportunities in the world. I figured out how to loophole this business. These people had been loyal to me. Um, a lot of them I knew, their kids. Uh, I wanted my integrity back. I wanted myself back. I felt like I had started to get that back. Mm. And so I knew in my heart that I needed to stand for the consequences of my own choices because these were my choices. Yeah. And so I turned down the prosecutor and he, he yelled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and we all thought I was, you know, going to, going to prison. And um, I got lucky, I got a judge that didn't sentence me to prison, but you know, I found myself 35 years old, millions of dollars in debt, convicted felon and a social pariah. And I had to come up with a way to get out of that. And I really believed that it was the story. And so I wrote this book. Um, and I thought, OK, pu pub date here. My life is going to change. 
And then, you know, very, very few people read the book and most of them were related to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I still believed in the story as, as the way. So I just got more strategic and I, I, I set, you know, I made this short list of the best filmmakers in Hollywood. And um, they were also going to have to be brave because there are so many people powerful people trying to shut this down, even though I had protect, fallen on the sword, protected them. Um, they didn't want this movie to come out. And I had a short list, and at the top of that was, for me, was Aaron Sorkin. Mm. He had just won an Oscar for the uh, social network, and I loved the way he wrote, and I, I, I felt he wouldn't reach for the low-hanging fruit. And so I started trying to get a meeting with Sorkin, and people laughed me out of their office. But when you lose everything, and you um, basically are publicly humiliated.